Hi everyone, welcome back to this wonderful series of Ruby Talks with Brooke. It's such a joy to do these. Every time we sit down, I just feel really happy that I get to have another conversation with an amazing person in the industry. And today we are joined by the glorious Yasmin Benoit, who is a, well, Yasmin, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Yasmin Benoit. I'm a model, asexual activist, writer, speaker, and researcher at Stonewall. Yay. And yeah, you do so many incredible things. And we're really happy to chat have you here chatting today. We're going to talk today mostly about asexuality and aromanticism and how they impact our like wider cultural understandings of sex and relationships and vice versa. We've got loads of really juicy questions to get into. So let's just dive dive on in, basically. Um, and Yasmin and I were talking before this, and I, I guess asexuality is one of those topics within the sexual health world that I feel like most people have still not gone beyond the 101 basic information. So we're going to try and keep the questions interesting. But to start off in a in a kind of for, for people who might not be as aware, I'm really curious about when the first time you heard the terms asexual, allosexual, aromantic, like when there was a distinction between like asexuality and allosexuality. Um, I mean, I think I heard the term for the first time when I was about 15, because I was kind of, I was in secondary school in like the Tumblr era. Um, we love it. And, yeah, and I was at an <laughs> all-girls school, so it was pretty like bi-curious and lots of people, they like knew about the kind of more niche orientations and someone suggested that I might be asexual and then I like did some Googling and went down a bit of an internet rabbit hole. Um, so that was when I first heard that word. I didn't I don't think I heard the word allosexual for ages after that. And I do think I probably discovered the term aromantic around that time, but I just didn't really care to use it. <laughs> like I didn't really see the point at the time because like the experience of being aromantic and asexual just blended into one thing. And I hadn't met enough asexual people to realize that there was actually like a distinction and that not all asexual people were aromantic. So I just said asexual for everything. And I do still kind of have that habit. <laughs> yeah. And for people who are, like watching this and brand new to all of these terms do you mind doing a speedy definition of like asexual aromantic allosexual yeah so allosexual just means not asexual super easy asexual uh, most widely accepted definition is experiencing a lack of sexual attraction towards anyone regardless of their gender and being aromantic means experiencing a lack of romantic attraction towards anyone regardless of their gender yeah thank you I feel like those are like imprinted in your professional brain <laughs> like, I guess it rolls off the tongue <laughs> <laughs> yep yep but it's I it's it's always useful to remember that people approach these topics at different stages and I still talk to people who have never heard of the term allosexual which I think really speaks a lot that we just presume sexuality on to people and then you have to like consciously opt out and so I I'm trying to use the word allosexual more and more to to like have a have a word for this thing that so many people take for granted I guess yeah I didn't really know if most people outside of the asexual community use the word but then I'm always in the asexual community so I don't know but it definitely <laughs> feels like something that we say and you don't really hear other people talking about um yeah. allosexuality or like encompassing all the other sexualities into that one group but it yeah. is useful to do like saying cis like it's it just helps to articulate that yeah absolutely I think that's yeah that's such a good comparison because more people maybe have an awareness of why using cis is important so Thank you. I like that. Um, and I'm really curious about what it's been like when you've gone into schools and spoken about this, because when I was at school, I mean, my sex education was rubbish and basically non-existent. And there was nothing about kind of any broadening ideas or nuance in terms of how we understand sexuality. And even when I have like gone as part of Brooke gone in to teach in schools asexuality is included but it's kind of included as part of the LGBTQIA umbrella and there's very rarely much time that's like given to talking about it specifically so how have students and teachers responded to you going into school settings and talking about this 
I mean, for me, I think it's being sort of indirect because most of my things ends up being like kind of 18 plus um, mm -hmm. more at university level. I am definitely going to be doing more in schools like this year, most likely. But a lot of my like audience on social media ends up being like school age kids. So they do know a lot more about it than I think people, well, people did kind of know when I was in school, but I think they know even more than what um, we knew when we were in school. And I have like met and spoken to a lot of teachers and there definitely seems to be more of a willingness to incorporate that and to just kind of have conversations about queerness in general. But the conversations always really start with the premise of we kind of mention it, but we largely don't. So yeah. it's gotten a little better compared to like, you know, my period, which was like 2007 to like 2012, but it's still not on par with the other orientations. But I think that there's definitely interest. And I think for students there, because they can access at least parts of the information online, I think it just seems kind of jarring that there is such a lack of it in school compared to what it is on the internet, which is definitely something that I noticed when I was in school as well. Yeah. And my experience of going in and teaching either in school settings, but also in like youth groups and especially queer youth groups, is that young, like queer young people know like more than I do <laughs> <laughs> and it's my job so, so you're like why am I here you could just yeah I'm like well you you tell me, you tell me stuff I'm, I guess I'm here to learn now so and that's always a really interesting dynamic where there are you know large groups of young people who are so well versed in this and really curious and up for having these chats but there's still lots of people where this is very new and maybe not something that they are thinking about or, like regularly or even have any awareness of so anytime you speak to a group of people I think it's always good to remember that like imagine that there's people from like all all different perspectives where something's brand new or something's like really really known to them so yeah and you announced a really really exciting project last year which made me very happy and researching for this as well I was like looking into it going yes this is so needed it's wonderful um so you there's the Stonewall and Yasmin Benoit ace project which I just want to nerd out with you <laughs> about like how how is it going so far you're like what almost a year into it and what are your kind of priorities with this project and how is it shaping out yeah, so for those who don't know, um, I launched kind of the UK's first asexual rights initiative in partnership with Stonewall. And at the moment, we're producing a report into asexual discrimination in the UK, uh, specifically in healthcare, education, and in the workplace. Um, so right now, we're kind of in like the kind of first draft of the report. We finished collecting all of the data. Um, and I'm hoping that like early this year, like over the next few months or so, hopefully we'll get it done. But, you know, Stonewall has a lot to do. And it's kind of just like, it really is just me. I'm like one other person <laughs> doing this whole thing. So it's, it's very much like a passion project in a sense, but it is something that like I was always very aware of issues happening within the community and legislative things that weren't really being tackled. And I was also aware that Stonewall at least were publicly saying that they had an interest in doing something about it, which is kind of why I approached them it was like, mm -hmm. okay, well, what can we do together to see what kind of difference we can make? And it's been quite fun because my background before all of this was in like social science, my undergraduate degrees in sociology, my master's is in crime science. So it was always very like research heavy and doing a report, it feels a lot like doing a dissertation and I've already done two of those. So it feels very familiar. Yeah. And unlike with dissertations, people are actually gonna read it. And it's actually, <laughs> it's actually gonna like make a difference and like influence something. So I'm very much looking forward to getting that data out there. Cause it's something that like, I know all about it. People in the community know all about it, but until there's actual research into that subject, no one else is really gonna know or take yeah. it seriously. And I think it's the taking it seriously thing, which it, it's such a shame that actually you need to formalize research in order for it to be taken seriously. But like, I'm so excited about what that will do when people who are not as aware of this or don't wouldn't think to prioritize it can actually see data and see what what happens and like what the reality of ACE existence in a very sexualized environment is like. So, yay, well done. 
also thank you for sharing the fact that I love I love finding out the like unsexiness of of sexual health stuff where you're like, <laughs> like everyone's like oh my god it's so glamorous it's wonderful <laughs> like you've done this project with Stonewall and you're like yeah it's me and one other person and I'm like <laughs> on my laptop all the time <laughs> yeah literally just doing like qualitative research like it's, it's nothing like wild or <laughs> glamorous at all <laughs> but I love that and I and that's the stuff that's really important I kind of a big thing I really try to talk about when I worked at Brooke full time and when I started now that I still do things with them and with other people as well, just that it's the unglamorous stuff that's the most important. And mm. when like when you're thinking about activism and right, like human rights and sexual health rights as well, it that's that's the stuff that I think a lot of us within this space get really excited about. So, yeah. Well <laughs> And it's harder to show that kind of thing. I think, you know, as I'm sure you know, when it's on social media, you, you can only really explain something that you can articulate in like a picture or like a few slides. So I think people only really see like the kind of cute, like colorful, fun stuff. And they think that that's like all that's happening. But there's a lot also, of other stuff that goes into it. Yeah. And I and like I don't think social media is a very good place where you can properly go in deep with something and have a lot of nuance and go you know share longer form things which we need to find a better way of sharing information with this stuff because I think when there's the pressure that it's got to be cute and fun and but fun and like eye-catching it it makes it it just adds another layer to getting to the conversations that all of us want to be having yeah so I'm hoping that at least one of the benefits of like I guess a report or anything that's like a long form is that it gives people time to like digest it which is something that social media doesn't really encourage you to do because you your attention span is like 30 seconds tops <laughs> next 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 <laughs> yeah um well congratulations on the project it's a really exciting thing and I can't wait for it to be out soon-ish take your time <laughs> I've gone out but soon <laughs> There's, I know there's a lot of people who are really keen to to read all the kind of stuff that you've you're showcasing, I guess, within the report. Um, next thing I want to chat about. So we're we're recording this in February, and I I don't know. I it's really it's super important, but I also it, sometimes it makes me laugh the fact that like the different months are like we've got this hat on this month. Now we're going to talk <laughs> about this thing, and then next month is something different. But they're all really important topics. So. In the UK, it's LGBTQIA plus history month. Um, and in the US, it's Black History Month. And I think that always kind of filters into like the way that we talk about things in the UK as well. But these are still seen as really separate conversations a lot of the time. And I think I hope most people will have an awareness that a lot of the time when we're chatting about queerness, those conversations feel really dominated by white perspectives and experiences. And I'm just really cur curious to hear what you think about this and how, I don't know, if I could just like hand over all the power to you for a minute, <laughs> how, how would you go about making sure that there's change where like queer people of color are prioritized and supported and celebrated? And there's kind of a like, it's not those two parts of themselves that are seen as super separate. I think that, I guess one of the issues that I think that like the kind of queer community has in general is that there's always this, this sort of misconception that if you're already part of a marginalized group then you kind of have like a get out of jail free card and you can't really like marginalize anybody else and you don't really have to like <laughs> check yourself or analyze yourself as hard as you would, you know, people on like the other side, because, you know, you're not about that life and you're not part of that group, which then leads to there being, I think, a kind of lack of awareness or kind of lack of responsibility there. And that's kind of why we've needed to have like a progress flag. And that's why there's needed to be, you know, like a UK black pride and all of these additional efforts to kind of make it more inclusive because, even within like the queer community, when you do raise conversations about like racism within that community, which is actually like a pretty obvious phenomenon, it's yeah. still seen as very contentious and people don't really want to go there because they're like, well, I'm already, you know, a marginalized person. So it's almost seen as like, you're kind of dragging the whole community down. You're trying to make everybody look bad. And, and it's very much the same with the asexual community as well. They have the same problem. And that's kind of why I, started doing this in the first place. I just found that all the conversations about asexuality were very white and the people talking about it were very white. The community in itself 
white people are more likely to identify as asexual. So they're more likely to amplify people that look like them. And then mm-hmm. you just kind of end up with like a kind of very whitewashed looking space. And that was kind of why I wanted to start talking about it. Cause I felt like I couldn't complain about there being a lack of like black asexual representation if I wasn't actively doing anything about it. And I know that, you know, in doing this, the reactions that I get speaking about asexuality and the reactions like my white peers get, like it's completely different. Like blackness is always being involved in my experience of asexuality from the beginning. So it's something that I can't really separate when I'm talking about it, but I think that that can be good because at least it's pushing the conversation along in a direction that it wasn't really in before. Yeah. And it's something I feel like intersectionality is like that word has done something really sad which like when there's such a hype about a word or a phrase then at some point it kind of loses its potency and it's like you know I hear lots of people using that word without actually really thinking about the context that they're in and especially a lot of kind of white queer spaces using that as a buzzword rather than actually thinking about what it means and the yeah I it's a tricky thing I think lots of people are, are feel kind of nervous to talk about it because rather than like leaning into a, a topic there's that initial thing of like oh fuck I don't want to get things wrong I don't want to like put my I don't know it, there's a vulnerability in like being keen to learn so I see lots of people kind of just leaning back and being like yeah okay I'm just gonna like wave my little identity which is very important and wonderful (laughs) but it's really I think it's really important seeing people like you but it doesn't it shouldn't just be on your shoulders of like actually talking about this and and like seeing people as themselves as a whole rather than picking out different little parts of them yeah and I think there's also this kind of I guess because as a community, we're all, you know, you're all kind of fighting for like wider like respect and recognition. And I think that there's also this sort of fear of like overcomplicating it by trying to tackle too many things at once. And I think that's why, you know, historically there's always been like a certain type of person that's kind of been the poster of a certain cause. And it's usually like a more palatable person because I think there's still this worry of like, oh, well, we don't want to make the community look bad. We don't want people on the outside to think, oh, well, they have all these issues. So, you know, why are we gonna like defend them or fight for them and stuff? Like whenever I've spoken about racism in the East community, I've often had people be like, no, you can't say that. That's gonna make us look bad. That's gonna make people think that, you know, we have an issue and like, don't like someone stop her from talking about this. And it's like, no, we can address, you know, things that are happening in the community. Like if you're gonna be fighting for like, you know, equality and like diversity and you can't, you know, put all that on this group of people expect them to get it. if you don't get it either like we should all be trying to understand the same thing yeah yeah and it doesn't work you can't be like okay hold that thought I'm just going to try and sort this stuff out first and then I'll come back and it like I think that compartmentalizing things of going yeah okay we'll just we'll just focus on the ace stuff and then we'll and then we'll get to the to the racism but just let us give us some time <laughs> like, that's not really how the world works um but thank you for voicing it I think it's really Yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to see change to make to just like, well, I guess for you to not be one like the only black woman talking about asexuality? I I mean, that's I hope that there are more now. I hope you've like created a path. But anything else that you want to see change in the next couple of years? Um. And I feel like for me, I would just love to just see the conversation just progress a bit further than the 101 because while it's you know I do respect that there are lots of people that don't know about it so we do still have to do that it's it's not like we haven't done this before like there was a sort of asexual mainstream peak that happened in like 2004 ish Mm -hmm. like to 2006 where you know it was on all the talk shows and it was in the magazines and like um, the kind of activists that kind of preceded me David J he was like the poster boy for it and we kind of had this and the conversations that he was having and the questions he was being asked are exactly the same as what I'm being asked now. And it's like, 
it's been a while. So it's kind of weird that we're now they're like, oh, what's this new thing of asexuality? And it's like, we did this already. <laughs> we're just going to have to keep doing the same thing over and over again. So I hope that we can kind of progress further than that, because that's where I wanted to like do the work with Stonewall, because it's like, we're so stuck on the, but what is it? What does it mean? It's like, once that awareness stage passes, we're going to have a lot of people that know about it and no legal protection. And as we've seen from you know, the sudden amount of attention that the trans community has gotten awareness sometimes doesn't always end well. <laughs> like there, you need to have something after that. So I tend to just kind of like think ahead in like a kind of strategic way as to like, what are we going to need in like phase two? Because we should really be at phase two by now. <laughs> and what does it feel like to be what, like, I think you are like the poster girl for asexuality right now. I'm sure there are, I know that there are like lots of other really amazing activists, but what what's that like? Because that kind of feels like a really complicated <laughs> position to be, like amazing, but also really complicated. I mean, it's weird. It's very ironic for me. Like, I don't feel like I have the kind of personality or like the tendency to be the person that ended up in this position. Like I very much lived by like a don't ask, don't tell policy for like a good 10 years. It was the subject. I was an expert at avoiding best friends that had known me for years, did not know what my sexual orientation was. I was super low key. So it's now really ironic that that's the thing everyone associates <laughs> with me. And they're like, Yasmin, the asexual girl. And I'm like, this is so weird. I spent like a good 10 years trying not to, <laughs> to make yeah. sure nobody knew that. So it is it is very ironic for me. Uh, so I am a, a, I know I probably don't seem that way on social media, but I am, a, I try to be as like inconspicuous as possible. And I, I, I'm just wandering around a forest and drinking tea and playing Sims. Like that's, that's what I like to do. That sounds like a time. really nice life, Yasmin. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm pretty chill. So to kind of be in something which is like the least chill environment of all time, it's all like, it's so inherently personal and so weirdly politicized and so judgmental and there's so much expectations and you have to always be on and engaged and retaliating to something and it's so not my vibe so it's quite ironic for me but I'm also grateful that I've I've found myself in a position where I've been able to continue being as unusual as I was when I was younger, which did not work in my favor at all, and see that it has ended up working in my favor now and being useful to people. So I'm grateful that I've been able to contribute to like the narrative, which, you know, I was pretty much left out of for a very long time. So I'm happy about that, but it is pretty weird. <laughs> I mean, I, that's something that I hope you feel proud of because I think so many people feel proud of you and grateful for you for that but it's also remembering that that pressure doesn't need to all sit on you like it's so easy to be like oh my god I'm the person like I everything I do has to represent all of this different stuff and just to like it, it sounds like you're really good at reminding yourself this but also being able to remind other people that you are you're like internet asexual Yasmin but you're also like the rest of the time you're Yasmin who isn't all of those like mm -hmm. not all those things are like the the like headlines of who you are mm -hmm. it's really good to remember that everyone is just really layered and you can't like just put someone as like oh that's the thing that you represent because you are obviously so much more than than just that one thing whatever it might be yeah and I think in a kind of ironic way I'm sort of in a strange way I'm a bit grateful that I was able to spend so much time being very inconspicuous because in not in because people didn't believe that I was asexual in the first place it meant that I was never able to like make my kind of label and that part of my identity very important I didn't really have a choice but at the same time I was like okay well now I just focus on all the other aspects of my character like my interest in sociology and all and reading and music and all these other things that were kind of more important and central to who I was. And now as an adult, it's like, okay, this is sort of like a, a bonus thing, but it's not the whole thing. So I'm sort of glad that it never became, you know, the be all and end all from the time I discovered that I was asexual when I was like 11, because that would have been like my whole life of this just being my number one thing. So I always try to encourage people like, Yes, it is, you know, important to understand your sexuality and, you know, it can be good to have language and labels, but it's also just like one aspect of your personality. Like it's, yeah. it doesn't have to be that deep all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a really nice reminder. Thank you for sharing that. 
Um, I have last big question for you, and then we're going to do a couple of like quick fire ones. And it kind of nicely leads on to this. I want to talk about pleasure and what it means to you, because there's so much sexual emphasis on experiences of pleasure. And I know, I guess, in some ways, that's still an important thing to keep talking about. Like, I, I it, we're still like so far behind where I want us to be in terms of talking about sexual pleasure. But also, it's really easy for pleasure to just equal sex in loads of people's minds. And so this is one of the spaces where I think allosexual people can learn loads from the ACE community about seeking pleasure and whether that's sensual in different ways or, or like not at all about like where you experience pleasure in your life. And I don't know, you can go like that can be, it can be like a surface level or as deep of an answer as you want, but I just think it's a nice thing to ask anyone. Yeah. I mean, when I kind of think of, of the word pleasure, it, it kind of conjures up two things. It does conjure the sexual side of things. And I do, and I'm like, I'm not one of those people that wants to avoid that. Like, I think there's definitely a misconception that, you know, if you're asexual, then you have no interest in sexual pleasure whatsoever, but like very much not the case. I'm very much down for sexual pleasure, just not with anybody else. Um, but then I also just think of like, well, this is kind of like a me thing, but I find I'm a huge heavy metal fan and music brings me a lot of pleasure. And sometimes when that guitar holo, solo like hits, that is, that is pleasure for me. Like that is like that exhilarating, like full body rush for me. <laughs> so I just like, yeah, I mean, the things that kind of bring me pleasure is just like being able to just indulge in the things that I enjoy. And it, te and it tends to be indulging in them in a way that doesn't concern anybody else like if I'm going to play a video game I like it's one player if I listen to music as a headphones on like it's just like a very me thing where it's just me and my own in my own bubble and my own vibe in my own world like that is what I find uh very pleasurable like that's the overarching theme and everything yeah. that I find pleasurable that's a really nice way of thinking about it yeah because because a lot of the time I, I guess another one of those like buzzwords of self-care can has kind of you know that that word in itself has become annoying I think for lots of people when actually what it's talking about is really important but centering yourself in the way that you experience pleasure and seek it out like I I love cooking for other people I just really really love cooking and thinking about food but I'm not gonna lie I have the best time cooking when it's just for me and when I can like <laughs> cook something exactly how I want to eat it and be really particular and make loads of food and just sit down and it's like just food for myself. Um, Cause I, I think often, especially people who have been like socialized and raised um, as women and femmes, there's that pressure that like you should be giving, like sharing pleasure and it should be about like experiencing it with other people or facilitating it for other people. So I really like that idea of you just like headphones on <laughs> it's very much a just, me thing just my music <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that right we've got a few speedy questions for you to end so what advice do you have for fellow ace and or arrow young people um I guess I'll kind of have to like go back to what I said before about the whole you know being asexual or romantic like it's just one aspect of who you are it's not something that's gonna change the whole course of your life it doesn't have to be something that's going to impact anything negatively it's not something that you know you have to like it doesn't have to be your be all and end all it can be like an experience that evolves and changes over time or it cannot be but either way like you're perfectly fine and you can just live life how you want to regardless like it's not it doesn't have to be a big deal if you don't want it to be Yay. Oh, I really like that. Thank you. What a great reminder. Um, next one. If you could bin one assumption about the ACE community, what would it be? I guess just that it has to be a, a specific type of person with specific personality traits and a very specific appearance and a very specific approach to life. Like it can be any kind of person. And that particular one has ended up being like a continuous thing throughout my life, the assumption that I don't fit the idea of what an asexual person is supposed to be like. But it's like, I do, but you can be anything. Like it's not a specific you thing. That, yeah. 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 <laughs> and that just creates like another additional pressure of like, oh no, but you're not doing it in the way that we thought was the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, and final thing, I would love to know one thing that you're excited about for the year ahead. And you've already mentioned the report from Stonewall 
and you is coming out soon. So I'm going to be cheeky and say it can't be that because we're, <laughs> we're already excited about that. Something else. <laughs> um, I'm just looking forward to being able to just meet more people in real life. Like now, you know, all the prides and stuff have really started up again. Like now the lockdowns are well and truly over. I feel like we've really kind of got back into the swing of things and people are a lot more confident to like get back out there. And so much of our interaction as a community is very much online. And so many asexual people have met others in real life so I'm looking forward to just being able to like go back out there with schools universities events and just like connect with people IRL that's so nice well I hope that you can do some like I, I know a while back didn't you do some events for as part of pride yes I did a ace of clubs the asexual pop-up bar at pride in 2019 so I'd love to do more things like that just nice in-person well, fun <laughs> amazing I'm going to be keeping my eyes peeled for all the wonderful things that you've got going on in the next year and thank you so much it's really wonderful to chat with you and I hope that everyone who's been watching finds this all really useful and inspiring is there anything else that we've not chatted about that you want to talk about <laughs> No, I think we've really nailed it. <laughs> hey, oh, I'm glad. Me too. Um, well, thank you for everyone who's watching. Obviously, if you have more questions or just kind of, yeah, questions and want to learn in different ways, then please head to the Brooke website. They've got loads of really amazing resources on there. And also follow Brooke Sex Positive if you don't already for some really great sexual health content. Um, and I will be back soon with another Ruby Rare Talks, talking to another wonderful person. But for now, thank you so much Yasmin it has been a real real pleasure chatting I feel like we've not met in person before and this is really nice because I feel like then when we do in the future I'll be like yay we, we <laughs> made that connection we did it <laughs> I know thank you very much for having me oh it's been such a pleasure have a nice rest of your day thank you